Hey everyone, welcome back to the It's a Mind Game podcast. My name is Jade and today I'm so grateful to be welcoming back Jacqueline Byrne, who is a psychotherapist who specializes in eating disorders. And we had a beautiful chat, gosh, only a couple of episodes ago, and it was so well received by our listeners and we had so much feedback in regards to positive input and reflecting that we just couldn't wait to come together again. So welcome back. Thank you so much for having me back, Jade. I've been looking forward to this very much. Yes, and we decided on a, I guess, a very common topic to talk about today, and that is the question that pops up a lot in the hate, sorry, the, not only the HA community, but the eating disorder community, and that is the idea that I've had an eating disorder for so, so long, and even though I want to heal, I've had enough of the thoughts, I've had enough of the guilt and the hunger and the moods and the social anxiety, all of those things. But I just can't imagine a version of myself that is any different than this. How do we, how do we work on that? How do we answer that question? Where do we begin? Mm. It is so important to talk about because it, it isn't uncommon that disordered eating or even a clinical eating disorder has been in someone's life for so many years. And I've, I've talked to people who have had this emerge very, very early um, in their adolescence or by the time they're hope seeking, it's been going on for many, many years. And so it's very much a part of their identity and also their outside world. It's how other people know them to be. It's what they expect. And the world that's then created about around them reinforces how they know that to be in their life. One thing I always find really powerful to come back to is that none of us were born with an eating disorder. It is, it is not an innate part of who you are. That can be a way of thinking that reduces internal conflict and may be quite useful in that regard to adopt for a period of time because if we're not able to change or it's dangerous psychologically dangerous for us to change then accepting it as part of how we need to get through life might be the path of less resistance and that can be a good thing but it's never innately who you are the personality psychologically developmentally speaking is developed by about the age of seven it's very very rare for someone to have an eating disorder by the age of seven and even when it does show up it's not usually the way it shows up later in life and I think that's that's something I always like to return to that it's not this is not in the innate scaffolding of who we are so from that we can we can safely assume that it's possible to exist without it and that there are pillars of our identity that are formed and steady deeper than where the eating disorder resides. It actually, it's quite a comforting thought to think about that idea that you just said, which is literally, it's not, we're not born this way. It's something that has evolved over time through different circumstances and influences. Um, and it's true, you know, you look back to the core foundations of when you are a child and gosh, I, I can't imagine even the thoughts of food and weight and things like that even exist, especially because you said the age of seven, because I even look back to say my personal experience and my earliest thoughts of really perceiving big, small probably didn't kick in until high school, like 12, 13. And I think that's also more when you start to be attracted to boys or girls and there's a little bit more of certain things look good, certain things don't look good, certain things fit in, certain things make you a bit of an outcast. And it's the first time that sort of really hits you in your life because early primary school, at least you'd like to hope for most anyway, it's just joy and love, you know, and of course there's a bit of anger and tantrums, but it's not generally caused by external sources that are, is judgment on physical appearance or food. Um, so just that idea that, yes, even our perception of what big and small is, that even is something that comes into our life later. It's, it's such, a, such a beautiful reference to bring into it, and it's so true. It's often in the the entanglement in that seeking to belong and then downloading social information on what we need, what the criteria is and what we might need to require of ourselves to have membership into that acceptance that starts to make us particularly vulnerable. But even for listeners who maybe did have body dissatisfaction quite early, like one, one risk for developing an eating disorder is being in a bigger body as, as a kid and maybe receiving bullying because of that or maybe mm. attempting weight loss in whatever way 
you you knew to or you had modeled to you when you were very young what I think is really important to extrapolate from that is when we last spoke you and I Jade we were really talking about an eating disorder as a relationship and when we understand Mm -hmm. it as a relationship we understand what type of resources are required for recovery and what recovery can even look like that relational component the egocentric experience of the eating disorder almost developmentally can't happen that young as as you're Mm -hmm. saying like we might have some of those anxieties but that more complex sophisticated component of what an eating disorder really is that is the dangerous part doesn't Mm -hmm. doesn't occur yet and so all of that all of that beautiful data is there from before the eating disorder really was centric in our life. So I guess when you have been working with clients and these sorts of questions come up, this, you know, I just want it so badly, but I, I just, I, even journaling, I can't, I just, I can't imagine this version of myself. What mm. do you think is a way that we can start to warm up to the idea? So you've made the suggestion that thinking back to our core and our early childhood, that that wasn't a part of us. And hopefully we've got lots of fond memories of that time of our life. So we've got one sort of pinnacle there to go, okay, there's some strength. I haven't always been this way. And it's actually more natural to me to be this way than what this new learned behavior is. What are some other tools or I guess things that we can gravitate to to slowly sort of, you know, grab the rope and start pulling ourselves into this idea that no, you know what, I I can evolve into this new and healthy version of myself. One thing I love to ask people to do is actually ask those that they respect in their life and who they believe really know them, that they they feel um, see the real version of them, what they why they mean something to them or why they love them. And when we do that, we two things can come through that are really valuable. And one is that people very rarely say it's because of a body size or a weight or the way that you eat or um, it, it gives separation from that being as much of a cornerstone in how we're received as it is for how we, the framework of our own relationship with ourselves, because that's of course part of an eating disorder experience is that those things feel incredibly more threatening than than they are objectively but secondly I think it can be affirming when words start to tally up so say say if if you did this exercise and you asked six people close to you what they appreciated about you what they thought of when they thought of you and several of them said kind several of them said warm several of them said generous um, which I'm sure they would then that starts to be a good evidence um, collection for for there being very genuine experiences of us away from what the eating disorder defines. And those are things that often, because I think part of, and I was thinking for this conversation today, part of what can also be really scary is that when we do hear stories of recovery, there is a lot of language of rebuilding and even being rebirthed or transforming or these very large scale endeavors for our personal world and our and our life. And it can be that feeling of who on earth am I going to come out of this as? Mm. But in in my experience, witnessing people through this process in my own lived experience, it's it's a funny polarity. It's an interesting polarity, I suppose, because in some ways my understanding of things and some of my belief systems and even my social politics have changed enormously. But on the other hand, if you just met me at a function then and now, I think I would come across quite similarly. You know, my, my affect is pretty similar. My tonality is similar. My mannerisms are similar. My interests are similar. My values are, are very similar. So those things, despite something like an eating disorder going through someone's world, doesn't tend to um, offstand those qualities too much. Mm. I have so many things to to talk about based on what you just said. (laughs) I don't know where to start. Um, But I guess just what you said with the the personality traits and like the core you actually stays the same. Um, 
it's it's really interesting so I even I think back to when I was going through my eating disorder recovery and that was such a big part of it was I'm not going to be me anymore if I don't have this and that was a very real belief like I wholeheartedly thought as you said there's such big and loaded words that come into play and I guess when you're coming from the recovered perspective they do seem very true because you do feel like you've evolved you do feel like you've changed you and because I guess you are healed, you're more receptive to those words and you have pride attached to them. But when you're not there yet, the idea of evolving, changing, it does feel like, oh, that has the capacity to flip my world upside down and I I don't think I want that. And then those controlling attributes come in where it's like, but I like that everything's predictable. I like that I, you know, this this little comfort zone that I'm in. And I just had the visual as you were sort of explaining that dynamic. And I think we talked about in our last episode, and it's come up a few times, how we do have different identities. Like we've all got, gosh, 5, 10, 12, 20 hats that we have on rotation. But it's almost like our eating disorder identity is the biggest hat. Like it's almost the novel one where in our reality, it feels like this is the pinnacle. So if we take off that hat, it's so easy to tell. Whereas if we look at some of the other hats, like kindness, generous, um, politics and like general views on, on life or your morals or your value systems, they're sort of like very similarly shaped hats. So when they interchange, it doesn't feel like a big deal because there might be a slightly different color change or a slightly different design, but they're so much the same that it doesn't feel intimidating when they shift because no one knows because it's all kind of seamless. But we take off this ED hat and it, it just feels so large to take off. And it's almost like throughout that ED healing journey, you start to recognize that this hat shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. And it's more apparent to us that it's important than what it is to anyone around us other than the sort of basic comment of, oh, you always eat really healthy or, oh, you really love to exercise. But it's very baseline comment where to us it's a very, it's a core value at some point. Um, I don't know. I'm, I hope I'm making sense. Oh, but just that, that idea yeah. that, that that hat does shrink and then suddenly it gets to a point where you feel empowered to go, you know what, I just don't want the hat at all. I'm going to either pop it in the back part of the closet or I'm just going to completely throw it out. But it, it, it really is a transition to get there and knowing that your starting point isn't that I'm evolved, I'm changed, I'm excited. It, it kind of happens as you go. I really like that analogy and I think that it's it illustrates the feeling so well where from I think it's part of the confusion for people on the outside looking in as well of, why can't you just set this aside? Like, why does it have to be the be all and end all of who you are? But when you're in it, it is the the statement piece. It's the it's like your wedding dress compared to the pair of jeans you've worn a hundred times. Like, it's just it's so much more meaningful and there's so much more investment in it. And letting it go um, can feel incredibly confronting. But that is that is often the experience of recovery. Is it? It doesn't. It's not that it becomes that it's ripped away from you or that you destroy it one day, but it just slowly isn't as interesting or it isn't as all-encompassing and other options just rise up in their receptivity and their um, how appealing they are, perhaps. There was a couple of things you touched on as well that I wanted to pull out that felt really important too, where... I've had some people say to me things like they're afraid if they recover that they'll lose things like their work ethic and their high standard for things and their way of being in the world that's also often really reinforced as being positive. And that's where if we look at the the idea of personality development those traits often are there in someone that's under seven. Like those of us that identify as perfectionists or attend, have a tendency to be more obsessional, for example, often did have little little rituals as four-year-olds. So we had like a 
very clean bedrooms as children Mm. or there were things that we lent into which might have been very muted at the time but with hindsight we can see um, the beginning of the flavor of something that could build and the, the fertility of what could come from that and it's because of that too that those qualities usually stay but they can actually be enhanced so you can be if you if you are a hard worker and you are driven and you are ambitious and that can be a healthful expression of perfectionism surely you would be more productive without an eating disorder you would be more productive if you were well nourished and had that value of expansion and sharing and and being a contributing uh, member of society so I think that's important to acknowledge as well that it's not when we're never wiping the slate clean that's not possible Mm. we're just we're just working away from something that is harmful but the rest of what we are um well it it is a paradox because I want to say the rest of what we are doesn't need to change but at the same time it's not an amputation an eating disorder isn't um the removal of Mm. a tumor um in terms of your personality and then you just go on as you were at the same time but it's like those traits can reform to be much more positive affirming influences of what you are as you said that I sort of had the visual of an Rubik's cube in my mind it's like either way we've got the same number of colors we've always got the same number it doesn't matter which way we twist it and turn it the colors are staying the same but we've got the concoction where the colors are completely there's not even two in a row which can be our eating disorder self because it our, our mind is very tangled when we're in the midst of an eating disorder and despite your work ethic or determination or structure throughout the day there still is this surface cloud that's always sort of shielding you because you're you've got other things going on and you know you start to take the eating disorder away and suddenly you've got this Rubik's cube that's still got all these beautiful colors but suddenly you've got a few more you know squares in a row and it's a lot more organized and neat and as you said sometimes it can actually accentuate your efficiency sometimes it can actually make you more productive because suddenly you've got the clarity that you didn't previously have because you were, you know, and anyone who's listening right now who's in the midst of an eating disorder, there's that constant like thought of should I eat, shouldn't I eat? When's the time to eat? Should I eat now? Maybe I'll do it later. What's going to happen for dinner? It's a, it's a, it's a commentary all the time. And we could be so good at listening to it and talking at the same time, but it's constantly there. And to have that little voice just slowly disappear, suddenly it is easier to focus just as though, you know, you and I went for coffee, Jacqueline, and we're having an in-depth conversation, but we've got someone talking in our ear as we're trying to talk to each other. We can still hold the conversation, but nowhere near as well as if we were by ourselves like we are right now, having a really in-tune, in-depth conversation, and we know exactly where we are, what we're doing, and how we're going to do it. Mm. That's beautiful, yeah. It really feels like that. And the, the capacity then is so supported by recovery. I mm. think to something else that comes up with that sense of risk or threat in recovery is often around socially what is expected of us because even when I was giving that idea of asking people close to you to feedback what they value about you, in the back of my mind, there's the awareness too that still those relationships are arranged around things like people pleasing quite often when mm-hmm. there is when there is an eating disorder at play. So while usually people are unlikely to feedback um, something specific to the eating disorder that they value about you, they may say something like, you're always there for other people. You always put mm-hmm. others first. And that can still reinforce, uh-oh, well, the only way. I can continue to do that is if I continue to manage the cost of that in this way that I I haven't created behind the scenes. So sometimes it is important to to hold space for when those social contracts are broken in that you maybe no longer are willing to put up with the same cost to your well-being to please others or push yourself into burnout or whatever your your past patterns or patterns with the eating disorder have been 
it's almost like it, it's maybe that last sort of 20% of social experience that can then be upgraded into something that will be of such better quality when you're able to be fully you. It doesn't mean it has to destroy relationships, although sometimes you might find it does highlight something that is quite jarring when you're in a more well space, you can see things quite differently. But that from that place of increasing self-worth, you would want that for yourself. And I think you're, you're so right in that how hard it is to imagine how it's going to feel in that recovered place. And that version of you looking back as an advocate for you now, because when you have more self-worth, those things almost don't come into question. Of course, mm -hmm. you want the better thing for you. But when you're on the forefront of that, it is scary to think about giving up some of those arrangements before you know that something else can rise up to meet you. Yeah, and I think as you sort of described with that activity of, you know, why do people love you or care about you? And it's it's so interesting to me that you brought out that as an example because I created a, a HR recovery ebook that's got lots of journal prompts and questions and answers in there. And two of the activities in there is um, who loves you and why do they love you? So it's that exact um, and it does say try and think of it yourself, but obviously if you're not in that position yet, go and ask the people around you and, and get that input because I do find that I guess two things is that one, when it's such an emotional thing, having, as you said, data can help us see the logic in the situation. And, okay, well, three out of three people said that they like me because I'm funny. Three out of three said I'm kind. Three out of three said um I'm clever or, you know, whatever it might be. So while we're trying to navigate this new terrain, it, it's helpful to have actual data to go, okay, of all the people I asked, whether it be two or five or, or 10, no one said anything to do with my shape or size or no one commented on my nutrition. Um, they might have said you're determined or, as you said, you know, you're always there for me. And I guess that's where it comes into the multi tiers of healing because your first step I guess my perspective on it is your first step is assessing that okay no one's actually commented about food body size or anything like that so that's starting to give you the confidence to explore what life would look like if you did play around with your current rules and boundaries so we're not even at the point where we're challenging doing everything for everybody else yet we're not even looking at it so you can kind of just know that it's there and take the initial steps and then you start to get the positive feedback of you know I made a decision that serves me which could be to eat a snack in between breakfast and lunch and I've learned that socially everything's okay personally I survived and I say the word survive because it feels like something really bad could happen it feels that threatening so I survived the snack Everyone else seems to be okay with it. And it's like the training wheels start to come off because we start to do things for ourselves and we start to learn how much our life improves by making these little tweaks. And then you might end up in the position where you start to recognize, okay, well, everyone refers to me as um, the one who's always there for them, but I'm starting to also witness that that means that I'm not there for myself. Where can we strike balance? But by that point, you've got a lot more confidence to pursue decisions that complement your own health. And it's a lot easier to get to a point where you go, just for today, I might say no to coffee because I'm a little bit tired or I've got a lot going on at work. I actually think I'd be a better friend if I talk to them tomorrow when I've had a bit of rest. And you are putting yourself first, but you're also being very caring to the friend as well because you can witness the fact that it's actually not an optimal time for whatever this task is that's being presented. I'm just going to put it off. But I guess all of these things don't happen just in the one realisation. We do need practice. We do need to have these little epiphanies because that is what gives us that confidence to go, what if just for today I tried this? Or what if just for this week I tried that? And, and starting to leave the doors open for that positive feedback loop. Mm. I'm so glad you brought that up, Jay, because it's, it's incredibly true and it's there for our protection. We spoke to last episode as well. This wasn't meant to be done in a, in a tight time frame or in a rush for a reason. And so just starting with what 
the next steps are and then reassessing with what makes sense to you at that point. It's okay to go from A to B, B to C, C to D and not A to Z mm. all at once and, and probably a lot more sensible and, and efficacious to do it that way. Yeah, and look, I'd love to hear your thoughts because one of the other activities that I placed in there um, was thinking back to some of your most loved memories and it could be, you know, you're you're four years old and you're giving grandma a cuddle and maybe you just know the smell of her perfume. Like there's just something really special about that. And it, it just, it's a standout moment. Or the first time mum and dad or auntie brought you a puppy dog or the first day at school or I don't know, I think we've all got certain memories and there could only be a handful over our lifespan, but they're just really important ones. And a lot of the time when you revisit them, you might be able to smell something regardless of it being there or not. You might feel the energy of it. You might naturally smile. You might cry. Like it, it depends on how strong that emotion is. And the activity is to, to think of those moments and relive them and be really specific as to what information you recall. Because when I think about those kind of moments, I can see it in my head. I'm quite a visual person. I can relive the memory. And literally everyone is as they look, but that's it. Like they are as they look. I'm not sitting there being like, well, grandma was a size da da da, and mum was a size this and dad was a size that and so-and-so was having whatever for lunch or those details don't exist in any of those memories. Given the fact if your memory is you're sharing ice cream with someone, then, okay, you're, you're going to be thinking about food, but you, you can see where I'm getting at. The focus isn't whether you made a good or bad decision about the food. It was purely the fact that, I don't know, you're in some fantastic location with someone you love heaps and it was a delicious ice cream. But just bringing back that the, the things that happen in our life that are so important and really take hold of us to the degree where we can relive something that happened weeks, months, years ago, the perceptions of what we value right now don't actually exist in those periods of time, in those, in those memories. Something you know, when, when people have something quite scary happen or they, they're going to hear some news and there's the potential of it being really bad news and it, it ends up not being and there's that instant relief. It's often in those moments where it feels most possible to if I use the word transform ourselves or to and I remember feeling that sometimes in my life where there'd be such a rush of the realness of life and the um, the infinite nature of our time here and the impermanence of it that I could break out of that cage just for a split second and just feel the possibility of actually none of this has to be here it is what transcends the, the human experience is it just sits above all of all of where anxiety creates itself. Mm. There's um, there's a, an idea I like to. It can sometimes it's called the two month rule, the two week rule, different time periods. But if if something won't matter in that amount of time, that you're not allowed to worry about it. And I try and use that for myself, whether it's yeah. a just life admin kind of situation that's frustrating or traffic or little things that come up and sometimes bigger things too but if if in two months you wouldn't look back and say gosh that's really impacted the trajectory of things that really held me back why is it worth our time now and, and most of those things won't matter in two months that so we spend so much of our, our time worrying about even within the eating disorder experience it won't be something that we're thinking about in two months time as a mistake we made or something we regretted we'll be thinking about the present moment then and perhaps the anxiety in that but it won't be it, it won't be as permanent as anxiety makes us believe it will be in those moments yeah I love that future self-practice I am um, mm. I try and draw upon it a fair bit myself and as you said for the smallest of tasks like something admin related or car traffic or you know it can be anything um but even the idea if I guess we're linking it into the eating disorder side of things where you know you you are starting to challenge yourself with saying having a larger meal or you're starting to add in breakfast and at that point in time it might be so difficult for you to see that this is a good decision but you might be able to see that you five years from now is really grateful that you ate breakfast because the person five years from now is very effortlessly eating brekkie 
and sometimes taking yourself out of your present self that is so heightened with emotion for whatever the reason might be and just being grounded down by the fact that like just like you said in the future what this isn't worrying us anymore but we just need to get to a point where we can let it go um so I, I do love that future self practice on so many levels of life it's you know, something just came to mind when you're talking about that um which I just wanted to share if it's comforting for anyone listening that, you know, I, I don't know how many people um, I've met that have recovered, but it's, it's a lot. And I've never, I've never heard anyone say that they've regretted it, that their identity was better when they had an eating disorder, that, let alone their life being better when they had an eating disorder, that while there might be components of loss and change, there is in life anyway like you're not going to be the same person in five years in 10 years anyway and loss and change is required to have outcomes that are going to be the very best version of what life could be for us it's such an important thing to bring up there that just that idea that people who have recovered um you have worked with so many more people than I ever would have but even if I just think about the amount that I've interviewed on the podcast that have recovered from an from ED or HA and everyone I've come across so far the same thing like I've never heard one of them say oh if I could go back I would. There sometimes is the feedback of, you know, I I wish I could have the physique, but with the mind that I've got now, but it's not a longing for it. It's just that idea that that was a time of their life where they, they appreciated that physical appearance, but they're not willing to go for it because they know how they need to live in order to attain it. And that's not exciting anymore, which is a really interesting dynamic too, because in the moment, it's like, no, everything must be this way. And then you have that that lifestyle shift and you might look back and go okay there's past elements of myself that I kind of miss but I would never sacrifice what I'm doing now and how I'm living now for that one thing exactly exactly yeah um, I feel like it's a good time to bring up the second question that we had um, discussed about as well, which is what does it mean to be recovered from an eating disorder? And I feel like I'm kind of tricking you as I ask that question purely because I feel like eating disorders are, they're quite mystic and magical in the way that they construct, they deconstruct, they come back together again and um you can have multiple eating disorders in a lifespan and they could be aggressive, they could be really timid and they're sort of like waves. They come and go and for some people they might get through their eating disorder and it's just done and others it might be gone for a little bit and then they come back for a little bit and then they recover again and then and I don't want to set that in a negative tone to anybody. I just think it's it's good to be open to the fact that if your eating disorder tendencies um, present themselves again that you haven't failed mm. like it, it, it happens and it's okay it's just getting more tools in your tool belt to get back to where you were before you had the relapse um, but what are your thoughts around what it means to be recovered from an eating disorder I do have some very strong thoughts on this because <laughs> it is it's something I'm very passionate about for a couple of reasons one is that historically eating disorders were talked about as something you couldn't recover from until quite recently that um, the approach to anyone presenting with an eating disorder in a clinical space was management of that eating disorder, not even exploration of what recovery could be for that person. And like so many things, there's still a hangover of that older framework that I think weaves its way into our modern psyche. So I, I very often hear people say things like, I know I'll always live with it. I know the voice will always be there, but dot, 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 you know, I hope I can still be better. I hope I can still achieve X, Y, and Z. And that really breaks my heart. That really makes me sad when I hear that because it does reinforce the same idea to other people. So if that, that is shared and someone else has some level of eating disorder experience or disordered eating, it suggests that or confirms that same limitation for them. Mm-hmm. But also we're very unlikely to exceed our own expectations 
of limits. So if we if we believe that's best case scenario, then that very likely will be best case scenario. We're not going to surprise ourselves by ending up beyond that. So just knowing that it's possible is really important to me. There are so many reasons why it doesn't always happen. And we could we could probably do a whole other podcast on that. And it's partly political and partly it has its own complication and it's not it's not to be insensitive to people that will have more of a challenge to find recovery to say that it, it still is possible um, as a as a concept and as a, a as a result for a lot of people and to me that is really you no know, I I really like that framework you brought in of the multi-tiered component of recovery and the tears of things like more black and white thinking, perfectionistic, um, people pleasing tendencies, those sorts of sub seven year old qualities that we have in us may not be recovered as such because they are us as then who would we be, how, how far back we're we going to reset. Um, but in terms of behavior and way of being with self in your body in the way that you're willing to think about your body to yourself and more than anything your relationship with yourself and your capacity to emotionally regulate so that you're coming from a state of settledness and groundedness and calm in how you evaluate what's okay in your life which is also to say to maybe live from a place more of intuition when it comes to food and exercise and trust your instincts more than external mm. ideas around it, to me is, is a very reasonable place to hope most people can get to with the right support and, and expecting that to take significant time. But that's mm. an outcome I would be hopeful to anyone that started working with me that that's where we're going to end up. Do you think that it's it's part of the healing journey? Because I I'm purely going off personal experience here, but um, I absolutely remember a time in my journey where I thought eating disorders couldn't be cured because I so I didn't seek treatment. Everything I did was just working my own mindset and you know navigating my way through, thinking about things, questioning things. Um, grateful the way everything planned out wasn't necessarily the most efficient, but we all have our paths, so I wouldn't change it for anything in the world. But I do remember there was, a, there was a long part where I I was very proud of where I'd gotten to the degree where I could eat foods that I normally wouldn't. I did have that flexibility. I could be spontaneous, but I would have active commentary like come in back and forth from mm. time to time or, um, my goodness, I don't think I, I was bulimic for a good 12 months and then I just had an episode for two or three weeks out of nowhere and went, oh, my, oh my goodness, what happened? And then it's it's never happened again. But at that point, I, I did believe that it's, this is with me forever. It's going to poke its head out and disappear. But then as I learned more about when it came back, I started to learn that the attachments were to stress or to relationships and that suddenly it wasn't the eating disorder that comes back. It's more the stressor I don't know how to cope with better. And then I learned how to manage those things better and now I truly believe from personal experience that eating disorders can completely go away because I wouldn't consider myself at all as someone who has an eating disorder right now. Um, I still make conscious decisions to eat well, but I think that's a very different thing to I can't eat this, I, I shouldn't eat that, and guilt attachment. And it's, it's very emotional. It's very structured. It's more of a, these foods make me feel good. I eat them. And if I feel like having something fun while I can do, it's, it's very, it's just flexible um, and it feels effortless and there's no guilt in the equation, full stop. Like feeling a fullness is okay. Feeling hungry is okay. It's just, yeah, I think effortless is probably the perfect word, but I guess just highlighting that to those listening that, yeah, there was a time where I truly believed, no, this is with me forever. I've just got to always keep my hands on the reins because I can control it. Like I've caged the, the beast, but now I feel like the cage has just been moved out. 
it's not there but again on that like tears of healing it, it was a progression I needed to have those little relapses to learn that it wasn't the eating disorder it was it was coping strategies that needed just the last little tweaks and I'm so glad that I didn't pursue the thought process of this is just me throwing the towel instead I was like but I know I I haven't done this whatever behavior for weeks or months why does it feel so important to me to do all of a sudden and it made me question rather than be like no see it's back give up so I guess just encouraging those that pursue because it doesn't have to be the ending just because you get a bump in the road it it just means we need a few more tools in our tool belt and the way you described it is the, the pinnacle of um how I think of recovery as well like it's just it's easeful and it's still means you have to have some kind of relationship with food to be human you have to have some sort of thought in yeah. it and some noticing of your body and uh, decisions around movement and um but it's the way that it feels that is just hugely hugely different and that it's I want anyone listening to know as well that one of the reasons historically recovery becoming recovered was so rare and statistically seems quite dire is that there was not treatment available for most people to support them all the way there and we're still we're still very much developing that in treatment frameworks Mm. so people would have occasional conversations with maybe a psychiatrist or a a GP and if they think that they didn't recover on the back of that and that's on them I please know that 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 is so unfair on yourself and no one can do this without some sort of influence whether that's um could be listening to a podcast or reading a book or finding some other information but if you don't find the right resources how do you find the the way of of building a new schema if you aren't exposed to it at all so it's it's really important to know that and in terms of diagnostic criteria where you no longer qualify for an eating disorder is very different when you're recovered and I just want to highlight that as well because Mm -hmm. not meeting the symptoms someone could still be extremely unwell physiologically as well as psychologically very much going through a significant experience but maybe drop out of that criteria that is not Mm. what that's not what being recovered is I think part of why I feel really strongly about it is um, in different eating disorder organizations I've worked in I've been responsible for staff working with people currently presenting with eating disorders and in the process of bringing in staff a lot of people would be drawn to those positions that had lived experience and we had these conversations extensively like how how recovered do you need to be for it to be safe to work with people currently going through an eating disorder and Mm. where is that line there is an industry standard which is for someone to be recovered for a minimum of two years before working back in the field but there's a lot of gray and a lot of subjectivity on what that recovered means and it could be interpreted as just no longer meeting the the clinical criteria so potentially someone could still be really unwell and sometimes that happened and we found out um, you know in practice that someone was trying to support people by very much struggling themselves and that is Mm -hmm it is unsafe because when you're in the mindset of an eating disorder you can't have enough objectivity to support someone else safely you can have a lot of sympathy and um uh, empathy rather and be be very supportive and be a valuable contribution to their journey but to be the cornerstone of their clinical treatment isn't safe so it is something from that part of my professional experience as well I I really realized how important this conversation is and and how difficult and complicated it is as well yeah because I guess even as you said and we'll wrap things up soon but just that idea of if you're assessing whether your eating disorder recovered it it is coming from an internal perspective as well if no one else Mm -hmm. is sort of questioning and even as you said if they are to question things that have been measured in the past which is you know weight restoration the capacity to eat 
whatever gets put in front of you, but it, it doesn't take into consideration the thoughts that are attached to these behaviours or these actions. So it, and, you know, it, it's even somewhat available to, to skew results as well because um, things that I've read anyway, there's, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that people, because of that people-pleasing mentality that we can tend to have, is that we don't answer truthfully to surveys and questions and even studies that you so want to participate in to help um, this area of research grow, but the internal systems block you from being completely honest because you've got other things going on. So as you said, it gets really complicated really quickly, even just to look at data or I'm just going to say standards in, in regards to, to levels of healing, levels of um, I'm going to say suffering because it's it's a hard time, um, but I guess that's where you know it is in itself as a healing modality. It is forever evolving, and because it's so dynamic. Oh, well said, Jade. Absolutely. But I'm so grateful that there's women like yourself out there helping those heal from eating disorders and also spreading, you know, newer information because every time we've spoken, you never come across as it's this short-term fix or it's just get weight restored and everything's okay or just eat the food. There's never just, you know, it's you've never spoken that way and I, I really appreciate and love that about the way you talk and I'm sure how you work with clients is that it is a journey and that it is about learning all these different things as we go and tweaking things and finding new things and exploration and adventure. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just so grateful to have someone like yourself come onto the podcast again. And anyone listening, I'm going to put all of Jacqueline's details in the show notes. If you want to reach out, she's got a fabulous Instagram website and she makes it incredibly easy to access her if you want to have a chat. So Thank you so, so much for coming on. I absolutely love our conversations and I hope there's many more to come. Thank you, Jade, likewise. Thanks so much for listening in on today's episode. I hope you absolutely loved it. Jacqueline is such a pleasure to talk to. Um, as always, I... I'm just grateful that you're here. I hope the podcast or YouTube is, is helping you get through your ED and HA recovery journey. Um, I would absolutely love for you to support the channel if you feel like sharing the episode, liking, subscribing, all of that is, is welcomed and encouraged because it's just going to help us grow and reach a greater audience. So as for now, I hope you have a wonderful day and an incredible evening and I will see you in the next one.